Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. On the podcast this week, we have Marnu Sharma, CEO, and Brian Reiger, COO of Labelbox, a startup that has built a full software suite for data labeling. On FYI, we've talked extensively about artificial intelligence from a hardware and algorithm perspective, but data is just as important. All production AI systems are based on supervised learning, which require large quantities of data labeled with the ground truth. Labels are the answers to what is in this data? What does it mean? Data without labels can't be used by most AI algorithms. While large internet companies like Google and Facebook have built custom tools in-house to help label and sort through their large troves of data, most enterprises have very few options. Labelbox aims to fill this gap by providing a scalable and easy-to-use tool to help companies convert their raw data into labeled data fit for machine learning algorithms. Just for getting started, we'd love to, I'd love to learn about your backgrounds. What did you guys work on before you started Labelbox? And really maybe talk about what was the key insight that gave you guys the idea to start a company focused on software for labeling uh, and how your past experience channeled into that. Yeah, Manu and I started uh, our friendship in college and we met in this class, this aircraft design class, and we were building competing aircraft in the class and we respected each other's work to the extent that after the class ended, we hooked up and decided that over the summer, instead of going home, we would work on building a, an optimization system for airfoils using neural nets, as a matter of fact. And this was you know, back in 2010. So neural nets hadn't progressed to where they are today, certainly, but they were available in MATLAB. Mm -hmm. And so we knew about them and we thought that we could use these neural nets for you know, solution space finding outside of gradient solvers and so forth. And so we went down that road and developed really a friendship around our work and passion for building technology and aerospace and aircraft design ultimately. Yeah, and in terms of uh, starting Labelbox, you know, fast forward, uh, it's been over 10 years that you know, we've known each other and we've actually worked on numerous projects throughout this time. But more recently, it was 2017 when I joined a company called Planet Labs. And Planet Labs is one of the most exciting companies in space that started I believe 2011 or 12. Basically, the company has about 300 or plus or more satellites uh, orbiting in low orbit, and the company is able to scan the entire Earth every single day. So think of Google Maps like imagery update every single day. And when I joined, my, a lot of my work was around building platform for analytics to enable our customers to extract insights from this uh, huge corpus of imagery data. And what I observed was that nearly all the insights that we wanted to extract from this imagery was uh, being the technology that we were using or the teams were using was essentially neural nets, uh, deep learning. And these were insights like deforestation. We could count deforestation in the countries and go to the government and say like, hey, your country has 2% uh, quarterly deforestation. You should do something about that or we could count total number of cars in the parking lots of Walmart across the country and uh, sell that insights to hedge funds so they understand the uh, buying behavior before the earnings call. So uh, really interesting insights, and they were all being extracted via this te technique of, uh, of machine learning. And it became pretty obvious that, that nearly every application that we were building with, uh, with neural nets required huge amounts of training data, or in other words, labeled data sets, 
and that as more and more companies build these uh, technologies themselves, they would have to build software infrastructure uh, to be able to do that. And at Planet, we were building this from scratch and uh, we thought, you know, we had this opportunity to com- build a commercial system so that companies can easily build those uh, the similar technologies using Labelbox. I see. How much would you attribute the kind of rise to these data labeling companies such as yourself to the rise in modern deep learning? Was this an industry? I assume this industry existed in some form before, you know, that th- this need even using prior older models still required labeling for machine learning techniques to work. But have you seen the industry basically grow in a very maybe irregular way as a result of kind of the modern rise of deep learning? For sure. Um, in fact, like only about seven years ago, I think when the ImageNet paper came out or AlexNet paper came out, I think that was really the point in time where the modern deep learning technology kind of really took off and has been growing uh, or has been doubling the efficiency of algorithms and compute since then has been doubling every few months uh, or so. And so the effective rise in uh, compute efficiency for this modern deep learning has, I think, is over 1000x over this last seven years, which is pretty insane. Mm-hmm. So data labeling actually existed for a long time. And one way to think about data labeling is basically supervision, human supervision. In order for humans to teach machines, they have to interact with the computer or machine uh, and tell it like what humans wants to wants machines to learn you can achieve that by a couple of things um and most classical way to do that is uh, this thing called software 1.0 where you're writing logic if else then so most of the world is made like that but uh, in in this new, a different paradigm which is software 2.0 you kind of really just label or you know outline an area of uh, interest in an image uh, and just tell it com- computer to to emulate that that pattern so that paradigm has always existed but it it really took off in the last 7 years because algorithms have gotten nearly free it comes in tensorflow or pytorch for free and these are state of the art algorithms compute has been declining in cost so the real focus for all of these companies that are adapting machine learning you know, wave is their focus is to build the right training data at scale because if they can do so then they can actually build production grade machine learning systems and operate them so tell us a little bit more about Labelbox, the product. The key about the key feature or the key use case is really to take large amounts of data and to label them correctly. What are the key kind of labeling problems that make this a kind of a tricky problem that requires specialized software? Um, how does your software work? Is it something I can install and locally and then apply to a bunch of data I have if I'm a large enterprise with a bunch of storage arrays in, in the data center? Or is it something I have to move to the cloud before I can use the software? So Labelbox is a training data software for building and operating production machine learning applications. And when you look into what it takes to build a training data software, so let's take an analogy. Let's let's spend some time to understand some what are the analogs uh, of that uh, in classical world. So the way we write modern software currently is in a collaborative environment uh, using tools like GitLab or GitHub, where you know humans come together and they're able to share the knowledge and review it, edit it, and debate it and uh, come to the right answer. Turns out that labeling is very similar to that process. You're capturing human knowledge and people have different opinions about the same uh, information. So teams need like infrastructure workflows uh, and tools that enables them to collaboratively come together and, and, and ensure that they are capturing the right decision or editing the decisions to in a form that it is right. And so, so Labelbox solves lots of these problems. So first of all, one class of problems is the tools that enables humans to label imagery uh, or videos or text and so forth. They have to be extremely performant on the browser uh, because they are all in the web and that enables lots of people to work together. And labeling software essentially has to also be extremely efficient to capture human perception uh, so that you can do that at scale quickly. And, And so those are the kind of problems we solve. Then the other big problems in labeling software is distribution. Like how do you enable hundreds and potentially thousands and millions of people over, uh, over the next few years to collaboratively work together and code you know, their perception into software? So it's basically a very big distributed computing problem. Like how do you distribute tasks? How do you get consensus with people and so forth? So, so a lot of those problems are solved with Labelbox as well. And then the third class of problems are training data management. So 
in an organization, as the companies start to build machine learning capabilities, they are going to create huge amounts of training data. And training data essentially is a collection of decisions from, uh, from humans or machines. So how do you manage those uh, decisions? How can you slice and dice and find the right decisions to solve new problems or um, have a, some sort of a system of record so that you always know what decisions machines were making and when they were bad, you can go back to them, correct them and teach computers again to make better decisions in the future. So those are three categories of problems that Labelbox solves for our customers. Mm -hmm. And when you work with enterprises, do, do they typically, does your software work in their local enterprise environment or do you have kind of a workflow where you migrate their data to the cloud first? So Labelbox comes in two flavors. Our most popular service is hosted in the cloud. So it comes as a SaaS offering. And then for companies like that are more sensitive about their data, they can deploy Labelbox in an on-prem cluster uh, or a private cloud. So uh, it's all within containers and Kubernetes. And, and so it can be orchestrated anywhere. Gotcha. And how, what is the pricing structure? How do you, how as a SaaS or, or either flavor, what is the unit economics that, that your business model is based upon? Yeah. It's an interesting problem to think about in terms of how to price, because ultimately where the value of AI is and machine learning is, is kind of at that decision point. When a tractor precisely sprays a weed and kills it, that's what you want to pay for. That's really, really where the value is. When a machine finds cancer in a radiology image, that's value. So that, that's really where I think the industry is moving to in terms of pricing. Today, what we do in the nascent environment of machine learning is we price based on kind of the amount of information that's being developed in Labelbox. So labeling and, and other forms of data development that's occurring in Labelbox. So usage in basic sense, but as close as we can get to kind of how the value is playing out for the organization. So an organization that's running a production AI system on Labelbox mm -hmm. is making a lot of decisions from humans and from machines, and that's coming together and driving forward a, a machine learning system that's out in the world, creating value. And so they would drive usage in that direction. Uh, the other axes for pricing is just sort of the tiers of label box. And so, you know, you have a, we have a free tier that you can use for free today, uh, log in and, and begin machine learning development on label box uh, with some of the best tools in the industry and grow from there into our kind of our pro tier, which is very common amongst growing AI startups and, and companies with, you know, early stage machine learning teams. Then we have our enterprise offering, which you know really brings that classic enterprise look and feel to and features and security to companies. Gotcha, Brian. When you mentioned that you know that the ideal way to charge customers is at the point of application, that makes a ton of sense to me. That's also really charging them at inference time after they've trained the model. Right now, you guys offer a service really at the top of the funnel, which is kind of during the the model training portion. Um, do you see a way where in the future you can, I guess, capture some of the value downstream where it's a result of the model as opposed to the result of uh, processing images? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two ways that happens today. And then I, I'll talk about kind of how in the future we'll, we'll work down that path. Today, one way this happens is if you think about a company that has dash cams in all of their trucks, that those dash cams are making decisions about driver behavior. Are they on their cell phone? They're also looking at the external world and looking at cars and are cars following too close and things like that. And those, those insights are being uh, consolidated and de delivered to the trucking manager so that they have an understanding of their fleet. Well, that system operates today sort of in this human in the loop way where this dash cam information is moving up into an environment where machine learning systems are working and categorizing uh, that video. But when, when the model isn't good enough, when the machine learning system isn't good enough to categorize that video for whatever reason, there's a human there categorizing that video. So that's kind of real time inference, so to speak, from a human eye that's all sort of symbiotic with the machine and they're working together. And and so that can be done on label box. And so you would find our pricing very much in line with kind of that platonic ideal today in that, in that environment. And then the other area where this happens today on label box is it's very common to have the decisions that a model makes. For example, if it's a, tr if it's a tractor farming and it's making decisions about weeds, the model decisions in terms of is the 
predictions of the plants correct or not gets fed back into the label box or, or the training data environment in general. And those insights are the, that data is used to derive insights about the performance of the machine itself and how good it is at finding weeds. And that, that, that insight derivation is done by data scientists, machine learning engineers, and they're using that insight to make informed decisions about how to improve the model. And so that's a usage pattern that has, you know, a scaling pricing. That's inference development. It's not quite at the application, but it's pretty close. So those are two areas today where it makes a lot of sense. Moving forward, of course, I think I will continue to tie the whole pipeline together. If you look at really mature companies like Tesla, for example, a well-known example of a company that uses computer vision wholly and completely to do self-driving, they have a continuous data pipeline that very much looks like label box in some parts and then has some pieces that are very cutting edge and, and complete that cycle, kind of that continuous integration, continuous delivery that would look very familiar to a DevOps engineer in the software world. And so as Labelbox moves and delivers value across that entire tool chain, we'll be able to continue to refine how we price and get closer to that application point. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I read a lot of industry reports and, and of course, analysts from the banks try to kind of forecast these market sizes, especially when they're trying to do deals with you guys. How do you view the market as a startup in terms of the kind of addressable um, opportunity? Do you do any kind of market sizing internally or do you mostly, you're so young and so early, you just engage with customers? How do you think about the market size for what you guys are doing? Yeah, the market size is tough, I think, just because the market's so new and you know, different studies and analysis say very different things. And I think part of that is just because people are including different things in the market, so to speak. So content moderation itself, if you look at Facebook or Pinterest or something like that, they're doing very large scale content moderation. And there are many social companies just like them doing that. And so that uses machine learning to some extent today, but also in includes massive human in the loop efforts. And so including that or not including that can sway these numbers significantly along with many other more traditional sectors of kind of this image analysis industry. So we think our rough addressable market today you know, for data labeling services and software and so forth, something like a billion. Mm. That seems like, you know, if you look across all the different reports and talk to, to different thought leaders, that seems reasonable. But the exciting part, of course, is that it's growing significantly, probably to the tune of 50% year over year. And that's because with the advent of deep learning, as, which is a subset of machine learning, we now have these pattern finding systems that can understand the complexity of what the human eye can understand. And so we're just seeing this massive adoption of this deep learning technology across every industry where cameras are involved or the human eye is involved in making decisions from claims, adjusting in insurance, to healthcare, to driving, obviously, to agriculture, to retail and fashion, and, and so on and so forth. And so I think that drives that growth. And the exciting part is that that's an enormous market eventually where every place where a human eye is making decisions, and maybe it's in a manufacturing facility, QAing seats going into a production vehicle, those processes are, are now available for automation and augmentation with the advent of deep learning and the commercialization of it. This billion dollar market, is this market that that is already, I guess, revenue collected today across the industry? I guess, is it consumed by uh, one or two large players or is it highly fragmented from, from what you can see? So it's, it's basically the total spend, estimated spend on, uh, on the labeling, you know, data, cre data creation and labeling and so forth. And um, I think a lot of it is concentrated perhaps in uh, among the technology companies or um, that are pursuing, you know, certain like self-driving cars, Googles and Facebooks of the world. I see. Um, so who have lots of data. Large internet companies. What's really exciting is that we are starting to see classical enterprises rapidly entering this this market and space and reinvent, like basically disrupting their the way they do business by embracing deep learning. And uh, what's even more fascinating is that they are able to build performant machine learning systems by essentially following a, uh, a checklist, if you will, uh, which is that they're able to you know, use technology to label data sets really easily. They uh, then train the models uh, using TensorFlow PyTorch, and then they uh, deploy it and rinse and repeat. 
And that's basically the higher level recipe of building performance systems. And the more data you label, the more likely is that your models are going to perform better. You know, a billion is interesting. It's, uh, you know, it doesn't sound large relative to some existing markets like databases and things which are in the tens of billions. But this is a market that basically didn't exist before. And we have, you know, as you said, the large internet companies with their intense content moderation needs doing the majority of the spend. But the rest of the economy has, has certainly going to be larger in terms of aggregate need. So it's not surprising at all. It's growing in excess of 50% percent a year. And it's still a small number relative to, say, the amount spent on compute. You know, between NVIDIA and Intel, that's probably four to five billion spent on, on training and, and a little on inference. So it's, it's kind of remarkable to me that this market is basically created out of thin air from, from the last five years or so. Yeah, what's really interesting is if you look at an AI company, so a true a P&L of an AI operation, um, what you'll find is the software costs in there, that classic cogs you're running, you know, you're, you're spending cloud compute and so forth. And you have, you have those very predictable now costs for operating a software infrastructure and, and application ultimately. But what's really interesting about looking at the P&L of these AI companies that are doing that is that they also have this cost of data development that is present early on in the, in the R&D and development phase and is also present into production and appears to be related linearly to their revenue for that product or service, meaning that for another dollar of service that or product that an AI company is doing in the market, they have a portion of that as cost in their data development. And we don't see that sort of shrinking right now significantly, right? Or like non-linearly. We see that as these companies are de- building and deploying AI products and services or machine learning products and services, they have this kind of this, this variable cost that's not going away. And so if you think about companies of all sizes and nature across the entire economy reinventing as AI, you begin to have this enormous spend that hasn't been there in the past. Mm. That's in addition to compute. And that is you know, on your cost of goods sold ultimately. And so that number could be enormous because there's so much of the economy that operates in the world where machine learning can automate and augment that, that work. In terms of the data you're seeing from your customers, is it mostly images, video, text? Where, where are you seeing the greatest demand relative to format? So Labelbox has been purely focused on computer vision for the last year and a half since inception. And so we, we primarily see images and videos on the platform from nearly every industry imaginable. And we also support basic uh, text uh, use cases uh, for NLP applications. And we, uh, we expect NLP applications to rise over the next year, but it's predominantly images. Gotcha. And what are some of the largest industry verticals that you serve today? Is it kind of... Are your customers the, the industries that you thought it would be when you started the company or has kind of the market changed in a way that surprised you with, wow, this is now all of a sudden an overnight industry that's very large and important for you? Yeah. So when we started Labelbox, uh, obviously our experiences were coming from geospatial world, so Planet Labs and Drone Deploy and Boeing and so forth. And when we released Labelbox um, on Reddit last year, early last year, we started to see all kinds of users come in with you know the, all their uh, nuanced use cases. So from day one, we kind of had visibility into the, this plethora of use cases in computer vision. There was not one use case that was predominant at the time. We kind of always also uh, wanted to build a horizontal business that would uh, you know, support all kinds of use cases. And so, so that has been actually true since uh, since day one. So fast forward now, we've you know our, our volumes of data has scaled over fifty x um, within a year. And uh, what we see is industries in transportation. So these are companies that are building computer vision systems for dash cams or even self driving cars and so forth. So certainly that segment uh, is is pretty big. We are also really big in healthcare. So we see lots of companies pursuing uh, deep learning systems for medical imaging. 
like identifying tumors or areas of interest that can assist doctors in decision making. We are also fairly big in retail or e-commerce. So think of like personal style, like a personal stylist uh, in a model that learns and adapts your needs uh, and kind of suggests you new clothes and so forth. Or um, Amazon Go or standard cognition like use cases where you can do autonomous checkout systems. Also uh, equally big in agriculture where companies are building the really sophisticated machine learning systems to identify weeds or automatic pick and picking machines for fruits. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we can continue to go and on and on, but those are kind of the f- few big industries that we see, but uh, we are truly a horizontal company where we see use cases from all, all, all the world. That's great. What's your favorite customer story in terms of before and after? What they were struggling with before they started using your services? What kind of software stack do they even have? And what were they able to achieve after uh, using Labelbox and establishing an AI workflow? One of our favorite customers is in transportation. So this is a company called uh, Keep Trucking. And you know, a lot of the companies in uh, fleet management or infrastructure management for transportation is trying to kind of ship smart dash cams for you know for truckers or commercial vehicles so they're able to provide a lot of insights to the managers okay how's your drivers performing and and so forth so this company uh, wanted to basically build a new product ai driven product this was before even they had any capabilities in that uh, domain. And the product had to do a few things. Um, you know, this dash cam is capturing all this image video feed uh, of passengers and drivers, and they want to ship ad- neural nets on the on the dash cam to identify the behavior of passengers and drivers. Uh, if there was an accident, you know, what was likely cause of that? And the model should be able to make a decision and, and share that decision to the managers in real time and so forth. Now, Labelbox came in play uh, to provide basically the full infrastructure for them to build this AI technology. And what they're able to do uh, within a few months with Labelboxes uh, and so forth. So they stream all of the data from these dash cams, millions of dash cams um, uh, in the wild. And they stream it into Labelbox, get it labeled by a human team that are, you know, classifying these events based on their understanding of, uh, of the business. And then they train their models and ship those models into dash cams. Now, what's really interesting is that uh, most production machine learning systems are not 100% accurate. You know, they, are, um, they usually are 80, 90%. The last mile is insanely hard. And Labelbox sort of continues to sit in this uh, real-time pipeline for them. So if the model makes a bad decision, or is unable to make a confident decision, they are able to fall back on a human team to uh, review that, uh, that event and send it back to their customer application within a few minutes. And so in a sense, Labelbox is a platform where they are labeling data sets to train their models, but they're also operating this real-time human-in-the-loop workflow that enables them to be in the market and offer a, a reliable, fault-tolerant machine learning application to the customers. I see. I think I didn't quite understand a nuance that Brian brought up earlier, which is you're not just a pre a tool for uh, for kind of data pre processing in the training stage. You you kind of also run in real time and pr- provide inference. Is that is that right? So um, so we provide uh, real time workflows, basically human in the loop workflows that are pretty essential for uh, customers that are that are in production today. So basically, if if a model does not make a right decision and uh, their application or the customer needs some in some of those insights uh, within you know within a few minutes, then they can typically these companies fall back on a human team to review that and send it back mm-hmm. to, to the applications. So, which is actually a big part of uh, today's modern machine learning systems. And that's actually one of the big areas that differentiates Labelbox among hmm. uh, everybody else in the market. We really focus on providing customers with tools and workflows that enables them not only to yeah. get to production, but operate in production. Okay, let's talk about that because um, since you know the since AI has blown up, we, we've seen, of course, the internet companies adopt it. We've seen a, f- a number of um, startups try to tackle industry verticals like radiology and, and so forth. And now, like labeling companies are are having kind of their moment in the sun. What would you say is the key difference? You know, when I Google for data labeling services, a bunch of companies come up. Amazon. 
being the kind of 800 pound gorilla basically provides a service for every little tiny use case in in the cloud and they have some you know since the old days they've had a mechanical turk uh, as a as an offering for data labeling what would you say is kind of the key thing that makes your offering different versus kind of this pretty wide competitive field there are two kinds of companies in uh, in training data space. One class of companies is uh, what we call tech-enabled BPOs or tech-enabled BPOs. Uh, BPOs meaning business process outsourcing. And traditionally, you know, BPOs were essentially uh, the back office work and, and so forth. And, and rapidly with this demand of AI services, they're, they're rapidly moving into data labeling service. Now, a lot of these companies are uh, primarily a people business. They collect data from customers, get the requirements and label that for them and so forth. And the other class of companies are training data infrastructure, like software infrastructure or pure technology. So the biggest difference with Labelbox and the others is that Labelbox is the software platform that a customer would ever need to build, create and manage training data sets for operating machine learning pipeline ever. Like that's, you only need one platform that has all the right tools and the right workflows and uh, automation capabilities that can manage the life cycle of machine learning projects. Whereas labeling services are kind of more transactional where you, you, know, you might want to need some uh, offshore teams to label data sets for you and so forth. So that's one key differentiator among us and the others. Now, why customers would want to work with label boxes uh, is as follows. Any company that is really serious about going into production, they need to have a strategy of how are they going to ensure that their models in production are always going to be serving the right decisions to their customers. And what if their models do not work? And you know, are they going to wait uh, until going launching into the market? Or they will perhaps have to adapt to a hybrid approach where the models are making decisions, but they are falling back to humans' expertise to, uh, to provide those insights. And what we see is that many customers today are taking this newer approach, which is hybrid, where they build machine learning models, but they also want to fall back onto human-in-the-loop workflows that enables them to go to the market day one, you know, which can be years earlier than they otherwise have, would have gotten. Labelbox enables them to do that. And so for particularly for those customers, Labelbox is ideal. And I, I don't think anything in, else in the market offers anything close to it. And secondly, Labelbox is a kind of a holistic platform where not only you can label data sets, but you can also manage all of your training data. So think of like an organization where there are tens of different teams working on different machine learning problems. And typically they need like a standardized way to create training data, manage it at a company level and need and have tools to visualize, reuse, edit those labels. And Labelbox is also, again, the only solution that offers that to, to the customers. Let me let that sink in for myself. <laughs> Interesting. So one of the things that we notice we're noticing, I mean, one of the ways to think about it is when you think about building software, you can write software kind of out of nothing. Mm. You can sit down at your computer and you can write, you know, a Snapchat clone kind of out of nothing. If you know how to write software, that software application can appear. With machine learning, it needs data to work on, right? It's, it's fundamentally not a set of logical sequences, but it is the pure form of a human application of understanding of these patterns of life on the medium for which you're interested in those patterns. And therefore you need that, that stream of data in order to provide that pattern understanding onto. And from there, the machine will understand those patterns in the context of that medium. And then it can begin to emulate that human intelligence. So company, a great example of this done really well is Expensify. Expensify is this company that categorizes receipts for businesses. So, you know, prior you would send all your receipts to the finance team and they would go through them one by one. And this one's for lodging and this one's for food. Now Expensify can do that pretty much automatically. But Expensify was just a startup early on. So how did they develop this system that could categorize receipts magically? Well, what they did was they built a product that ingested receipts from companies and sold that service at a really good cost so these companies would buy it versus having, you know, maybe a BPO do it or something like that, or, uh, or their internal finance do it. And then on the back end, they were having humans categorize these receipts in the early days. 
all of the receipts. And of course, they were raising venture capital funding so they could operate this loss while they were developing machine learning systems in the background that were able to work into the system and start to automate receipt categorization from 0% to today, probably north of 98% or 99%. I'm not sure exactly where they are, but it's probably remarkable. And so Expensify needed that data stream early. So they built that software product and began to ingest this raw data through their system and build this visual receipt recognition and categorization technology on that data stream. First by having humans do everything and then have humans do some, and then now humans do only a fraction, a small fraction. And so all machine learning kind of has that look. And so if you can start in the Expensify way by bringing label box in and operating kind of AI in the loop, so to speak, or machine learning in the loop, and then build from there, you're starting with the real production data. You're starting with the real problem and you're starting at a place where you're providing immediate value to the market. And those are all great places to be. And then from there, you develop this machine learning technology, which gets you to your unit economics through, you know, a good grok of how capable machine learning can be for that application. And those things are becoming fairly well known at this point. Hmm. Brian, I, I, I thought the Snapchat contrast was, was great. It was kind of like a concrete example of software 1.0 versus software 2.0 that Tamanu alluded to earlier. It really, you know, in traditional, when you traditional software is built and software 2.0 is, is, is trained or learned. And it's like with traditional software, you, you write it in an, you know, IDE, you write it in, a, in an environment that manages your code and, and all its dependencies, right? And with, uh, with software 2.0, you basically need the same kind of software or framework or, or workflow, whatever it is, to manage your data. Because that's that is what's basically creating the weights in the end that that make the whole thing work or not. Labelbox is basically providing the whole way to manage that workflow. The, the second half of of the kind of well, the mirror component that you need uh, for for software two point to work. That's absolutely correct. What's really fascinating is like uh, these uh, in software two point the form, the way the machines learn is in a form of label data, and these are essentially decisions. Currently, they are very intricate, like minuscule decisions, like hey, this is a car or this is you know, a tumor, and so forth. And what we see is industry going to continue to move in in a more higher order perception, where you know we would be able to converse with machine in a higher levels, uh, not in that intricate way. But you know, Labelbox is that platform that, that uh, companies need in software 2.0. The only thing ap- after Labelbox comes is training models in uh, TensorFlow, and then of course deploying them and scaling them. Let's talk about that for a second. Modern AI kind of had its breakthrough in part because of um, model breakthroughs. AlexNet was, you know, a, a better version of neural nets that came before, and now we're seeing kind of in you know 2019 the thing that's really working now uh, that wasn't that was still kind of research and uh, want uh, a desire a few years ago is kind of transfer learning. That's kind of the the new rage, whether it's image models or, or text models, being able to pre-train on an existing well-known data set, getting to a really good baseline of performance, and then just uh, training on a few new categories with very, very little data, you can get very high performance. That's a new kind of phenomenon in, in deep learning. How has that affected your customers or your business? Is it good? Is it, is it bad because it reduces volumes? How does, how does the change in model architecture, how has that influenced your business? Yeah. So I think uh, nearly every customer or our user uh, uses transfer learning. I think it is by, by and large, I think it's fair to say it's a default m- method to build uh, machine learning systems today. And uh, what's n- cool about that is a lot of the world looks has similar features. And uh, so you can kind of create this, uh, so to speak, a neural net that it understands basic things of real world, which gets tuned to a particular use case with, uh, with not as much data uh, that otherwise would be needed to train the models. And it's actually been great because uh, for our business, because it has enabled all these businesses to, to enter machine learning uh, in the first place uh, and, and make it it's more accessible for uh, every team to you know, simply come create a model with even a few hundred images and, and get something working. And we actually don't see um, this as a detriment to our business at all because at the, at the end, volume for us uh, doesn't necessarily mean uh, 
labeling data from scratch. It also, uh, as Brian had mentioned earlier, customers typically bring the model predictions into Labelbox to visualize and review and so forth. So ultimately, Labelbox is more driven by production uh, use cases, which nearly every production use case has exponentially higher usage for events or decisions. But um, transfer learning is great. I think it will continue to be a pretty dominant form of production style machine learning. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I guess as a parallel technology that's kind of risen at the same time as deep learning is drones. They started off kind of as toys that people flew around in parks. And now we're seeing serious companies, whether in industrial or construction, use it for for monitoring and uh, real applications. From your perspective, how are you seeing the drone market affect kind of data generation, are they a kind of a meaningful customer for you guys? For our insurance space, yes. A lot of insurance, uh, home insurance relies on understanding everything about a house. And that typically means that your these insurance companies are collecting data from airplanes like Cessnas flying over cities or satellite imagery and, and even drones. And typically they are interested in understanding the state of your roof did you have a swimming pool? Do you have uh, fences? And are you complying with certain regulations and so forth? And a lot of these companies are now building machine learning models to decipher that uh, signature from all these sources of data. So certainly, like I think through our insurance or geospatial customers, the, one of the streams of data is drones. And I think we will, you know, we don't necessarily see direct drone customers as much uh, because ultimately drone data is fed into classical uh, businesses, whether it's construction or agriculture or inspection. But what's really cool is many people uh, in Labelbox were some of the earliest employees at a company called Drone Deploy, which now is by far uh, the most popular drone software uh, for commercial applications. And a lot of the use cases that uh, we saw at Drone Deploy, now we see at, uh, at a much more mature level. So in the early days of drones, people were more interested in just getting a third perspective from the sky. But now nearly everyone is more, most interested in insights. Like, hey, what can that, what does that data does for me? Like, how can I get automated insights from this data? And nearly all of those insights are being developed using modern machine learning techniques. When I look at the business model of kind of Labelbox, it's fundamentally an enterprise software company. You're using a, a software as a service model. I've kind of spent this year looking, learning about that space more broadly. And what's, what's so clear is that sales and marketing is so much more crucial to this business than consumer internet and especially social media and things like that. And we've seen some companies take more of a consumer approach uh, or, you know, I, I guess, an asset light approach to customer acquisition. Companies like you know, Twilio and, and Atlassian basically acquire customers organically. Have you guys thought kind of about your go-to-market strategy in terms of how you acquire customers? What's your philosophy and, and how do you kind of, I guess, uh, manage that relative to cost? You know, Labelbox has a free tier, so you can, you can go to labelbox.com and log in and, and so we have that you know, Twilio or Segment or, you know, GitHub experience. And what's important about that is it, Labelbox is a, is a designed product that is somewhat of an opinion about and an understanding of functional excellences around how to do some of this training data development. So when you see Labelbox and you can log in, that's a language with which you can sort of begin to understand are the best of the label box understanding of how to do training data development. So I think that's really important for the community and the industry as we continue to iterate this form and you kind of can experience in the same way if you were a marketer and you were experiencing, you know, HubSpot. That's an important way of continuing to mature the conversation across the industry of how we do training data development and machine learning development in general and continue to iterate that. But the difference, as we've talked about, is that in order to build a machine learning system, you need this data stream. And one of the difficulties with that is if you're a small, nimble team and you don't have a data stream, it's kind of impossible to build machine learning uh, or machine learning systems. So that presents a bit of a challenge. How do we kind of overcome that so that we can really have this community-wide kind of start from scratch and, and iterate towards creating value in the economy. So that's a hard problem. There's a few things we're doing and there's, you know, there's synthetic data is emerging and maybe that will help and other you know, data sets out there that are emerging. And we're really excited about being a place where people can find data sets and, and begin from you know, a transfer learning system of their own, maybe limited data set and a, and a big base data set that's available in the public domain. 
and, and begin towards building you know, a product or service that's of value in the market that way. But that is a challenge in that you can't just write machine learning from scratch. You do need this data stream of some kind. And, and the best data streams are the ones that are very specifically about how your application is actually going to operate and make decisions, your machine learning application. So that's something to think about for us. But our general go-to-market has been the companies that have big sets of data, big data streams. These are enterprises and, and growth stage companies, growth stage companies that kind of are, are trying to disrupt an incumbent with machine learning or AI as their competitive advantage. So those are, you know, those some drone companies, some healthcare companies, obviously self-driving car companies and, and agriculture companies and so on that for one reason or another, whether they're a hundred year old insurance company and they have a hundred years of claims, that's a great place to start when you're machine learning effort, obviously. So anyways, our go-to-market is very much focused on, around teams that are working towards production and have that data stream of some kind that's representative and accessible for building on top with machine learning. Generally, do you find that they find you or, or you go, re- go out and, and find them? They find us. In fact, all of our success has been organic. So to your earlier point of like companies like Atlassian and, and Twilio, uh, you know, Labelbox is largely driven by the developer community. The engineers and the product managers, people mm-hmm. who are interested in building these systems, they find us online. They try our software for free. They find it valuable. Then they reach out to us like, hey, I've got to uh, get a license so I can build a production system. That's awesome. Um, just to close off, I thought I'd ask a question on that I get a lot, which is, you know, every time there's a discussion about AI, I get questions on, uh, you know, what about jobs and, and things like that. And it's so obvious, of course, that the data labeling job didn't used to exist in any uh, scale. And as a result of artificial intelligence, now globally, we have people who in, in their downtime or in their full time can basically do a, a sit down job of, of labeling data. At the same time, we've had some pushback from, from you know, investigative reporters who've, who've uh, looked into these, some of these companies that offer these services and some of the conditions, working conditions can be pretty bad. I think you've, you, you uh, uh, made a trip recently to India and for a partnership, but of course, I'm sure you've interfaced with, uh, with a lot of these companies that provide the actual human labor for, for data labeling. What do you think is, uh, what have you seen about how these jobs, uh, what they actually entail? Do you think they're decent, that they're good jobs? What's the right way to think about this? So there's kind of two questions there. One question is kind of the outlook of jobs as, as machine learning automates and augments. And then there's a question of, you know, there's this growing data labeling work globally. And what are the ways to think about the ethics of that? And is that a sustainable industry that we're going to build on top of? I mean, it fundamentally has to be. And so what are the things we, should, we ought to be thinking about there and pursuing to make sure that's a stable backbone of, of a healthy working environment to build this, you know, kind of next industrial revolution on top of. So on the first question, there was a lot of discussion about jobs and so forth. Obviously, we've had many technological advancements over the human race's existence, and we've only continued to have more jobs and more people. And that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it would be a lot of what we see is actually just a, a, um, an amplification of a particular person's skill because AI is not 100% perfect in these, in these applications like radiology or, or, or farming or, or what have you. And so one way to think about this is today there's radiologists, there's an X number of them, and they're mostly in certain areas of the world. And so there's other parts of the world that just don't have access to radiology or people to, to look at their eyes and, and look for diseases or their skin and look for cancer and things like that. If those radiologists are tapped in this developing AI work or machine learning work to develop machine learning systems that can emulate their expertise, the cost of, of having access to a dermatologist, for example, or radiologist is significantly reduced. And so now with you know, a camera on every phone, you can have people in other parts of the world have access to the best possible dermatologist or radiologist in the world, like actually just a group of them working together to get consensus on that expertise, and then distributing that through machine learning systems onto a phone that go and operate everywhere. And, And copying, of course, that model, like copying software is free. And so I think one way to think about it is, you're going to have these radiologists or dermatologists, you're just amplifying the amount of people that they can help. Because right now there's just straight up an unlimited or a, a limited supply of them. And there, continue, there will continue to be. On the data labeling side itself, you know, we recently visited one of our main partners and they have 
really a, an incredible facility. But I think one thing we, we're learning today is there's two models that are emerging. One is this crowdsourced model. And the other is what we call like managed services model or captive model. And in the crowd model, what happens is you, you basically bid out this labeling work with instructions. And the work has to be pretty simple kind of at the outset to do. And people log in from their own computer and they kind of do this gig work. And that is really subject to you know, bidding wars on price. And these workers are not in a working environment where they're getting the healthcare or support from a community. They're kind of in isolation doing work at, at the lowest, you know, the lowest common denominator price. So I think that is questionable there. Labelbox only does managed services where companies operate facilities, like the one we visited in India, where people are employees and they develop expertise on the particular application over time and they work on the same labeling uh, work over time. So they're developing expertise, they're participating in kind of the machine learning environment, and they're working for a company, they're versioning professional in their region, and they have opportunities for growth and, and learning and things like that. So I think that managed services model, that captive model, really makes a lot of sense and is actually an asset as well to the customer. If you're a, um, a cell biology company and you're teaching, you can actually teach these people, let's say in India, that don't have a biology background about cancer identification. And, and we're seeing that on Labelbox today. So that's really exciting. And that now is a group of people in India that can continue to be capable of identifying types of cells and cell cancers and things like that as new use cases arise and this cell biology company works on new problems and scales out. So they actually are developing kind of this trained workforce in a sense, this like very narrow trained set of biologists in, in an effect. And so that's exciting for the industry because we may see certification programs emerge. We may see certification programs and so forth. So there are many things to consider here, but exciting and concerning, certainly. Are you seeing the industry for, for data labelers kind of concentrate in a particular country kind of as maybe call centers were? Is there like a global emergent place to be if, uh, for this industry in terms of scaling? Or, is, or are you seeing it more distributed? I think there, there's certainly some concentration in countries that where people are able to speak or comprehend English. And you know, these are places like India, Philippines, or certain parts of Africa. And you know, the, the cost of typically the, the wages are lower and, and there are a lot of access to people who are looking for employment. So that's, um, that's what we see. Now, one thing is really interesting is like Labelbox does not entirely rely on outsourcing work because it's collaborative software. So you, you know, if you are a, a medical imaging company, you could basically invite your expert doctors onto the platform and label it with experts in the United States. But you could also outsource the labeling uh, through our workforce uh, on that platform, so kind of augment you know in-house expertise with outsourced labeling, and and so in many ways, it's kind of like GitHub. And what we are seeing is that roughly half of our users or customers they outsource work, and and they rely on their internal experts to review that data or or even label that themselves. I see. Well, Brian and um, Manu, it's been an amazing conversation. I've learned so much. Thank you so much for coming on the uh, Arc FY podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks, James. That's it for this week. You can find the full ARC team on Twitter. We'll catch you next week. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.